Good evening. Thank you for coming and thank you for weathering the storm. Um, I am Michael Molinelli, Molinelli Architects. I do a lot of work in academia, so it's important to have a lot of letters after your name, otherwise they don't listen to you. Um, AIA, American Institute of Architects, lead leadership in energy and environmental design. An interest of mine before we call this sustainable architecture, before we call the green architecture, passive solar architecture, way back into the 1970s. Um, and NCARB is National Certification of Architectural Review Boards. It means I took a national test. I can get licensed in any state. But like I said, the importance is that I have as many letters as I can after my name, because otherwise no one in academia listens, listens to me. I've um, been in uh, private practice for uh, about 30 years. I was uh, mentored with Don Ryman, who was a local architect. Um, I grew up in Briarcliff. Don was in Briarcliff. Uh, last place on earth I thought I would end up in my life, and now I'm living in the house I grew up in. Uh, when I was in high school and college, I thought Briarcliff was the most boring place in the earth. And there was recently a study that confirmed it was actually the most boring city in New York State, so I was vindicated. Um, I do a lot of gut rehab institutional work. Um, schools, child care centers. I have a church that's uh, un been designed and we're getting municipal approval. It's going to be built in Harrison. Um, some modern houses. This is a house in Scarborough. Uh, I've done some churches. I got married in this church in Spring Valley. Uh, hospital work, healthcare work. This is a hyperbaric chamber, the largest hyperbaric chamber on the uh, east of the Mississippi in the United States. Seats 12. We can discuss why you need to have 12 people in a hyperbaric chamber some other time. Um, this is a, an addition going up now in Briarcliff to the Faith Lutheran Church. Did a lot of work for Pace University for many years, uh, unfortunately before their big building boom. Um, and then uh, a lot of work for EF, who uh, is an international language school. They bought the old Marymount Fordham campus in Tarrytown done a lot of renovating there as well. So that's, uh, I, I learned early on that I better start explaining what I'm doing because people after a certain point say, well, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, in addition to the architecture, I, uh, I write and I speak on architecture. You'll see if I'm any good at it tonight. Um, I did do a 12-part radio series for Radio Maria on religion and architecture. And if you're saying, what is Radio Maria, you're not alone. I think their entire demographic is for three nuns in Louisiana who don't get EWTN. Um, but it was about religion and architecture, which is a subject on which I speak on a number of occasions. Uh, and uh, it's a 12-part series, and like the last six parts get really Catholic, but the, the first parts are about all different religions and all different cultures and, and how um, philosophy and theology influences architecture. I've also uh, been a cartoonist, um, was so as an undergraduate at my uh, university of, uh, at Notre Dame. Um, Architecture is a five-year program, so I did a daily cartoon strip for five years. And uh, about six years ago, the alumni magazine asked me to revive the strip and revive the characters and make them age a little bit and see what they're doing now. So I've been doing an online version of the strip for about uh, five, six years now. And in fact, um, this is the commercial part. So you, uh, we just put a, a, a collection of all 581 cartoons I did as a student. just came out in June. It's available tonight as a discount. Makes an excellent Christmas gift if you know anyone who went to Notre Dame. And if you don't, if they ever went to college, they might find some of it funny as well. And then I have a general book about architecture. It's part manifesto, part uh, memoir. Um, but it's some of the things I talk about tonight appear in that book as well. My most important project is my family to date. Uh, my wife, uh, our twins, our seniors uh, in high school, they're looking at colleges now, so I'm panicking. And then Philip is a, a sophomore, and they they go to uh, um, all the the um, they go to all the Catholic schools around here. We can go into that some other time. Uh, Luke is in Regis in Manhattan. Charlotte is in Maria Regina, which was my wife's alma mater, and Philip is at Stepanak, which was my alma mater as well. So the topic tonight, we'll get into that. That's the that's enough of uh, me. Um, great moment in Hudson Valley architecture. The uh, there's a lot of architecture around, and a lot of you might be familiar with it, which is why you're here. Um, I always take a different point. I'm not a historian, and I've, I've spoken to groups where there's like, historians in there, and they want to know exact names and dates and things, and, and I'm not very good at that. I'm bad with names. I'm really bad with names. But I like ideas, and I like concepts. And I'm also fascinated with how things sort of grow out of something in, uh, inane, suddenly becomes very important. So we're going to kind of take a look at, this is not a, 
uh, comprehensive view of all the great architecture in the Hudson Valley, but it's sort of a look. I think it's kind of important to, let's review the history of the Hudson Valley. Um, and since I'm going back to uh, pre-Columbian days, there are no pictures that I can put up there. So what I've done is I've created sort of a, a metaphor of borrowed pictures from another source. So uh, prior to Columbus, there were six Muncie speakers of Algonquin that uh, occupied the Hudson Valley. And then right around the uh, 16th century, two um, explorers, uh, Verrazano and Hudson, explored the lower regions of the Hudson Valley. Um, by uh, a little later, you had a Dutch West Indian Company formed. Um, so at that point, a lot of what we know as the wooded hills of Westchester were completely denuded of trees. And we grow up around here, or we live here, and we think of Westchester as the place where all those trees are. If you came here 200 years ago, 150 years ago, this would all be farmland. And there'd be very few trees here. This is why we're getting more deer and coyote and bear than we ever had in recent years. Um, eventually, the English came in the 1640s, and by 1683, Westchester was officially a county as uh, um, commissioned by the Crown of England. Um, in the 1800s, uh, Westchester, with the railroad, became a county of millionaires, building their own uh, manor, uh, emulating the lords and ladies of England. This was their goal. At one point, Tarrytown had the highest concentration of millionaires in the country. Uh, and a lot of that had to do with the railroad. In the 1900s, though, we saw those big estates being divided and sold into suburban tracts. And that's when that uh, increasing number of houses were being built, particularly post-World War II houses. Um, then by the 1960s, uh, Westchester as a corporate land began to really expand. Companies were leaving Manhattan and setting up corporate parks. So that's sort of a uh, quick dramatization of Westchester County, Hudson Valley in, uh, through history. We're starting off with one of my favorite buildings. This is from my hometown, the Briarcliff Lodge. Uh, it was built in 1902. Guy King was the architect. He was uh, Beaux Arts trained. Uh, out of Philadelphia, was eventually known for country clubs and things like that. But this was the uh, dominant and the most um, elaborate and the most exquisite hotel in the United States at the time. You could, uh, it was in Briarcliff Manor, I don't know how familiar you are with that. It was on one of the ridges, it was where the King's College was for many years, they took over the building. Um, it has since burnt down. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But it was this elaborate, Tudor building that hugged the ridge as if they were in a defensive mode, almost like they were a castle. It was as if, if the Visigoths from Scarborough came here and were charging up the hill, they could throw boulders and hot oil on them. So it was designed to look like a, a uh, Tudor mansion. This section here was uh, heavy timber frame, but this section added in 1904 was built with concrete structure. They were already doing reinforced uh, concrete at this point, and so that was sort of a novelty. Um, the building was elaborate, uh, had elevators. It ha you could actually, the first hotel in the United States where you could make a long distance phone call from your room. You didn't have to walk down to the main lobby. Uh, people, Queen of Siam stayed there. Uh, Tallulah Bankhead used to go there. Uh, the Astors would go up there. Uh, Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt were there. It was the place to go. It was built by Walter William Law who was an, uh, came to the United States as a young man from England, made his fortune working his way through uh, the W.J. Sloan Carpet Company. And then for health reasons, he was told he had to leave Manhattan. And he, in, um, in 1894, bought the farm. And I mean that literally, not metaphorically. He bought the farm that was Briarcliff Manor, 5,000 acres. Um, he called it Briarcliff because there was an Episcopal priest there who had named it Briarcliff after some place that was in England. And then one day, Dale, um, Andrew Carnegie, I should say, not Dale. <laughs> Andrew Carnegie came up and was visiting Walter William Law and saw how well he lived and said, you are certainly Lord of the Manor. And that's how Briarcliff Manor got its name. So the insides were elaborate. The lodge was Law, William, Walter William Law's hobby. 
So he had a house, but he apparently could not stand still. He built the Briarcliff Farms into this exquisite dairy farm. Uh, the milk would be put on the trains on the old Putnam line, um, what's now the Briarcliff Library. Uh, the train cars would be lined up. The milk would be taken every morning to uh, the city. Uh, they developed a award-winning rose called the Briar Rose. Um, all sorts of things were going on. He had this whole theory about uh, healthy food and dairy food and that sort of thing. And the cows were well treated, from what I read. read. Um, and the hotel, like I said, was sort of a hobby. It was just a place for uh, people to stay. But it was nothing but the best for him. And uh, let's see. There we go. But eventually, the building was abandoned. Um, you know what? I left off one of the more interesting things, that um, behind the hotel, what's now a pond. If you look at the bottom of the pond, you can see tile. It used to be an outdoor tiled pool. And the stories are told that that's where Johnny Weissmuller trained for the Olympics long before he was Tarzan. And then we also uh, read accounts that during the uh, Prohibition era, they would uh, have a snow festival. And occasionally, they had warm winters, and they had no snow. And they would truck, I mean, uh, train down, put in train cars, snow from Canada. And the rumor is that uh, bottles of Canadian whiskey would be buried in the snow. So anyway, they, they got around things. So the building, uh, the lodge closed in the 30s. Uh, and it was a school for a while. And then it was bought by the King's College, which was also a, uh, a college of, uh, in the 1950s. That shut down or it swapped, did a land swap in 1994, and the building was abandoned. And this is when uh, Briarcliff was trying to figure out what to do with it, and there were different people, and one group came along to buy it, Barrington Venture. There was a group before that, that um, Tara Circle, and um, a lot of people in Briarcliff worked a long time to make sure the Irish didn't move into the neighborhood. It was a very, very bizarre and interesting period. Um, the Barrington Venture proposed to knock down the building and then build uh, senior housing, uh, assisted living, uh, independent living, and eventually critical care. But there really wasn't a reason to um, knock the building down. It was in good shape. It had great bones. And I, um, I led a short campaign with a few other people to try to save the building. We were not successful in having the village say, build what you want, just preserve the building. So when they got the right to demolish it, um, they put a fence around the place. They spent one summer of 2003 uh, taking out all the insides of it, or salvaging all the wood paneling and the stone and all the fireplaces. And then right before they were about to start a very expensive abatement process, because you have to abate a building even before you demolish it, it caught fire. It was a very convenient time to have a fire. On a Friday night, something smoldered all day, Saturday, so no workers were there. The volunteer fire department was uh, ready to come over. That's actually me on the ladder. I'm a volunteer with the uh, Briarcliff Department in the hook and ladder company. Um, I won the right to go up to uh, the stick, and it was a surround and drown operation. They pumped water from the, uh, from the pond. Um, not much to save. The wood section came down, the concrete section was there, but that was the end of the Briarcliff Lodge. What struck me, though, uh, and we can go into the whole history, but as an architect, as someone who sort of studies these things, why were they building Tudor buildings in Briarcliff Manor in the early 20th century? And you look around Westchester, you see all sorts of Tudor buildings everywhere, in one form or another. So this is uh, Bronxville. This is a little Tudor building right on their, their downtown district. Even in Garth Road in Scarsdale, this is a you know, five-story tall brick building, and they stick Tudor detailing on the top of it. So why are we doing this? Why, why are we, we uh, interested in that? And this, someday I'm going to show this, and this is going to be someone's house, and they're going to be very insulted. But what happens is as we keep imitating a style, we sort of rip it of its core and its heart and its soul. So, the Tudors would never have imagined this kind of detailing on top of a brick building like that. That just wasn't what's going on. And this is a house that's not a very good example of Tudor, but someone was in love with Tudor style, and so they, they attached Tudor elements to a house. But like I said, so what was it that was happening that a colonial um, country uh, that had built basically neo-Georgian 
houses out of wood suddenly was fascinated with Tudor or other styles. And I trace it back to the German Romantic philosophers of the 19th century. I have two up there, George Hegel and Karl Schlegel, because they rhyme, so it's easy to sort of put them up there. This was um, a counter to the primary history of Western Europe, or of, of the West, which was Greco-Roman. It was dominated by Greco-Roman beliefs, architecture, philosophy, and the Germans were feeling left out. I mean, so at this time, the German Romantic philosophers were, were creating stories or reviving stories of the Teutonic Knights. And a lot of the Wagnerian operas were sort of came from the same inspiration. It was about that German culture or northern European culture was just as good as that Greco-Roman stuff that they were doing near the Mediterranean. So there was this, this battle going forth. And, and Rome looked down upon all those northern Europeans because they were uncivilized, right? They cooked with butter and they drank beer, when everyone knows that in the civilized world you cook with olive oil and you drink wine. Um, so that's the dichotomy. So the revival of this style of architecture had a lot to do with the German uh, Romantic movement at the same time that travel between the continents became easier and safer. And so that as a rite of passage, the American nouveau riche uh, would go to Europe. And anyone studying architecture, this was about the time that architecture became uh, a profession of academic roots rather than the mason or the carpenter going, working his way through all the trades and becoming master builder. This is when it became an academic study you would go to Europe, and they were so fascinated with the instant gravitas of all these hundreds of year old buildings that they not only brought the style back to the United States, um, they also literally sometimes brought the buildings. And a lot of them were dismantled and, and brought back to the United States. And yet, what do we call this style? And we call it Tudor. This style was, I mean, the Tudors, this is the uh, mini-series uh, on Showtime. Um, very good for history about Henry VIII and the family, full of gratuitous sex and violence. So you could decide whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but if there was any sort of salacious detail in history about someone being tortured or someone having um, coitus with somebody else, they depicted it very explicitly. But there was a lot of good script in there um, in terms of the struggle between let's say, the, uh, the Protestant and the Catholic uh, religions at the time, a lot of the political struggle. So there was a lot of good detail in there. If you could stand gratuitous sex and violence, it was worthwhile. But the Tudors were this 15th century dynasty when that kind of building was going on easily 7th century, 6th century in Europe. So easy, about 1,000 years before the Tudors were there, they were building what in architecture school I learned was called French half-timber construction. So how did it become associated with the Tudors? I think it had everything to do with real estate ads that putting French half Tudor construction, uh, half um, timber construction on a real estate ad just took up too much space. And if you called it Tudor, it was a lot more romantic. But where did it come from? And this is, uh, this is my theory. So if you go back to Rome before it fell, and we're about 300 AD, and you were in uh, Gaul someplace, and you had a nice little town, and you would build a typical Roman house, which would be, uh, consist of brick. Romans had a phenomenal brick industry, but they never liked brick. Brick was not a material of the um, elite. And so it was always covered over in plaster. They wouldn't expose brick in their homes. Uh, you probably had a raised terracotta floor. Uh, if there were hot springs nearby, it would be a radiant floor. They would pump hot water through it. You had water running through the house from the aqueduct. And you had a, a series of atrium palestras um, with a terracotta roof. This is obviously a cutaway. There would be more to that. So if I'm living in northern Europe in a nice Roman town, and suddenly <coughs> Rome collapses, and, sudden, and we've got Goths and Visigoths and Vandals running through, destroying everything, what happens to my nice little Roman villa. 
Well, I'm sorry, this is an example of um, Nero's Palatine Hill. Again, completely out of brick, but everything was covered. So just reemphasizing the point that the Romans didn't particularly care to express their brick. So we're, we're at the uh, pillaging and the rampaging and all the ravaging going on as Rome fell, and you're left pretty much with just a ruin. Generally stone on the bottom, because it uh, can take the compressive strength, and then brick above that. If I'm in northern France, in northern Germany, and Rome has fallen as a civilization, there are no more brick factories, there's no Rome depot for me to go and get building supplies. What do I have an abundance of? I have mud and I have trees, and I'll build on top of the same foundation. So this is an idolized version of that, but my feeling is that Tudor construction came from the Dark Ages. It was what was done when you had nothing else to do. And in the 19th century, the German Romantic philosophers took that style as sort of unclassical and elevated it to the status that it sort of has now. Um, this, is a, a, this is a little advertised. So this was a, a house I did in Greenwich. I did the tower and everything to the left, built on a 1920s revival. But there's a certain amount of randomness and frenetic energy inside a Tudor house because it was originally built as a defensive piece of architecture. I've got to get my walls up soon because the Visigoths are coming back. They just raided the next town and they heard we still have some gold, we still have some food, they're coming back. So there are a lot of examples in the Hudson Valley in the, of these mansions that were built as a means to create your own little castle. So uh, we have here in Tarrytown, uh, Norman Castle built in 1897 for um, General Carroll, architect was Henry Kilborn. Uh, we have this other house. This was actually built for J.P. Morgan's minister up in South Salem, 1907, Atterbury and Atterbury as the architects. And then this house in Tarrytown, Neo-Dutch, uh, it was owned by Mark Twain for a few years, at least two. We're not even sure if he spent the night here, but it's Mark Twain. If he even you know, breathed on the deed, that's good enough for me. Um, 1916, sort of a, a neo-Dutch uh, gable and roof here. All three of these buildings survived the Depression. They're still around today. When houses and homes like the lodge or large houses were being divided up or knocked down, um, these three survived. And there's a reason why all three survived. Can anyone guess? They're all restaurants. Okay. So, what? Equus? No. Uh, Le Chateau. Le Chateau is closed? It's open again. Is it? I had to eat at all these places to do my architectural research. So sometimes architectural research is very tough. But this was uh, Le Chateau, which we'll check, uh, open and close. I checked to see if Equus is still called Equus, because it was, it's been bought at least two times since I started the presentation. And Abigail Kirsch works out of here. So what, especially with Equus or Le Chateau, is that for the cost of a meal or a mere wedding reception, right, you can pretend you're to the manor born for one night, and that's sort of what they're selling. They're selling that, that uh, black tie dinner, Downton Abbey kind of feel to, uh, to your dinner. And so what makes these buildings survive is that they get repurposed, because as if you saw Downton Abbey, as the century, 20th century progressed, labor costs and the opportunities for people in service began to expand, and it became very hard to manage and support these very large homes. Some of the larger homes are also, um, maybe not as large as these, were turned into uh, funeral homes. Again, you needed an organization that had some sort of commercial interest to make them viable. A few of these, like Equus, went through a stage where it was just abandoned or being used as someone's office as well. On uh, Popeil Island off the Hudson Heights, there's uh, what's called Bannerman's Castle. Bannerman was a munitions um, factory owner. Uh, I, I believe he goes back to the Civil War. Anyway, uh, or if, if not him, his family. Um, this is an island in the Hudson. Uh, he built this castle here, which was basically, at one point, a place for him to store munitions, because New York City was not fond of him storing a lot of explosives 
in Manhattan for, for some silly reason. Uh, but then he ultimately built this kind of fanciful castle here. And it's in disrepair. Uh, Rob Yasinak is, uh, runs a website called Hudson Valley Ruins, where he photographs a lot of these buildings before they're, they're demolished. And there's even a society that's raising money to try to preserve this castle. Since this photograph was taken, there's probably less of it standing. 